Good afternoon, everybody. It's Chris White at the California Fuel Cell Partnership, and we are ready to start our webinar. Everybody is on listen-only mode. Um, to answer the first question everybody has, the webinar and the recording will be posted when we're done this afternoon. We typically take all of the questions that were asked and summarize those and post a, a big Q&A as well. And sometimes that takes us a few days, but we will get that posted for you as well. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Martinez and Gerhard Oxley from the Air Resources Board, and they're going to take us through the presentation. Thank you, Chris. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so this uh, presentation is to provide a discussion on the 2017 annual evaluation of fuel cell electric vehicle deployment and hydrogen fuel station network development. Um, this year, as in previous years, we're going to uh, go over the findings and the methods that we've utilized for our analyses. But in addition, we have a few special topics this year that were um, new to the report. And okay, there we go. And so, just to make sure that everybody uh, is on the same page, I want to start out with an overview of what exactly AB8 is. Um, amongst many other provisions, AB8, which was signed by Governor Brown in 2013, allocates up to $20 million annually for hydrogen infrastructure investment. And this is carried out through the uh, Alternative and Renewable Fuel and Vehicle Technology Program uh, through the California Energy Commission. In addition to setting up the funding availability for hydrogen fueling, uh, for hydrogen fueling infrastructure, AB8 also includes requirements for reporting um, both from the Air Resources Board to the Energy Commission and then also annually for a joint agency staff report which you may have seen uh, this past February, the second one, the 2016 version, was, was released. In ARB's reports to the Energy Commission, these are actually due every June 30th to the Commission, and then we follow up later with a, a public release uh, for a cleaned up version that, uh, has, that was actually released a couple of weeks ago, and that hopefully you have all had a chance to review at least a little bit before today. The topics that we cover are current and projected fuel cell electric vehicle fleet and station progress, an assessment of coverage and capacity and the need for new coverage and capacity through additional station develop, development and investment, uh, recommended station placement, uh, an actual, the actual level of the funding for the next round of, of um, fueling station investment up to that 20 million allowed by AB8, and then technical specifications that would be required for the next set of hydrogen fueling stations. This is all predicated on the, um, on the fundamental principle that hydrogen fueling stations are needed ahead of fuel cell electric vehicle launches in order to enable their market launch. Um, having the, the hydrogen fuel stations out in the public and where the likely first adopters are able to see them will help first adopters feel comfortable that they can make the switch from your conventional gasoline-powered vehicle to a hydrogen-powered vehicle and be able to complete all of their daily needs or all their typical transportation needs with this new fuel, this new zero-emission vehicle. So with that background, I'll jump right into the findings. And the first finding uh, regards the status of the hydrogen fueling station network. I will, uh, just as a, a disclaimer, all of the Figures and numbers in this report are as of uh, July 27th, 2017. Um, so as of the publication date, there were 29 open retail stations throughout California, and those open retail stations are enabling fuel cell electric vehicle sales in several of the first adopter markets. In particular, you can see that there is a, um, a sub-network starting to develop around the San Francisco Bay Area. There are several stations that are actually starting to, to potentially provide the first semblance of redundancy and coverage along um, the coast in, in Los Angeles and Orange County. And also in Southern Orange County in the beach cities, there are several stations that are, that are starting to form a sub-network. Importantly, Coalinga provides the opportunity for fuel cell electric vehicle drivers to travel between Southern California and Northern California. And the Truckee and Santa Barbara stations provide um, 
the ability to travel to these um, popular vacation and destination areas. Now, as of literally the day that we actually posted this report publicly, uh, that 29 became 30. And I'll go back and forth here again, just because it's very subtle, the difference. If we look at Torrance, that station was, as of the, the time the report was um, published, was a non-retail with an upgrade to retail expected. But that same day that this report became public, it actually has become retail. So right now we have 30 public open retail stations. So as I had mentioned, those 30, the 30 open retail public stations provide actually a great deal of uh, utility to fuel cell electric vehicle adopters. So, um, and a demonstration of this was that First Element Fuel, one of the station developers and operators, actually completed a record setting drive of 1,438 miles in 24 hours. Um, I believe this was in celebration of Earth Day this past year. Um, so as I mentioned, there's fueling available in se several core markets. The station Koalinga enables that north-south uh, travel. And here we can see that this is essentially, this is not exact, uh, but this is kind of a representation of the route that the first element team took all the way from Los Angeles and Orange County through Koalinga to Sacramento, using the Truckee station to get over and into, actually into Reno and back, then taking a tour over to the Bay Area back down to Santa Barbara, to Los Angeles and Orange County, and even a small extension down to San Diego and back. And so this is a demonstration of really the utility uh, that these vehicles provide, but also of the status of the uh, hydrogen fueling network and, and how these vehicles in concert with this network as it's developing is providing a, a great deal of opportunity to the, to the drivers. The second finding, uh, concerns the recent awards through GFO 15605 um, announced in Jan, I believe in February, uh, by the uh, uh, California Energy Commission. And these 16 new stations significantly expand the functionality of the network and the marketability of fuel cell electric vehicles. There are several important notes here. First of all, three stations have been awarded in San Francisco. So this provides the very first coverage for fueling options in San Francisco, and it provides it with a high degree of redundancy and, and overlapping coverage through these three stations. We can see that in the East Bay, um, there are an addition of new stations that will help expand the coverage in, those, in that area, and, and some of these stations actually are providing redundancy to some of the previously funded stations as well. The same is true down in the southern end of the East Bay, where we currently have multiple stations open right now, and so the new Sunnyvale and, and second Campbell station will, will provide backup to those existing stations and enhance the coverage in the area. Similar story with the uh, new stations in Orange County and in Los Angeles. And the Santanella station will provide a second fueling option and potential backup for uh, drivers making that north-south trip along I-5. So it's going to be uh, critically important to continue looking to uh, strengthening the coverage and the fueling opportunities along long distance connector travel routes like I-5 uh, between North and South uh, California. And finally, a new station in San Diego has been awarded closer to the, um, to the population center in that area and will be able to, to start, uh, uh, start building that market um, in San Diego. So our third finding, finding three, concerns the pace of development of the hydrogen fueling uh, network. So station development has progressed. 37 stations are expected to be open by the end of 2017, and all funded stations are expected to be completed by 2020. Even though there has been a significant amount of progress, there are still some stations that continue to present difficulty, and typically these stations have been those that were awarded in the earlier phases of, um, of the, uh, in the earlier grant stages of the program. And so some of these issues that these stations have faced have actually been addressed with the newest uh, solicitations from the Energy Commission. In particular, PON 13607 and GFO 15605 have enacted requirements for dates that certain milestones need to be met 
um, in, the, in the development of a station from fully constructed to operational to fully open retail status. So we, even though we've seen that there's been a history of, of um, some difficulties with some stations, we expect that the newer stations, and in particular the stations funded by GFO 15605, will not have the same degree of, um, of difficulty going forward. That being said, if we compare our station progress with what we had uh, projected last year, we do have a, a slower progress than we had projected, and we now count fewer stations in the overall funded network. Um, there are now 62 stations as opposed to 66. Uh, there are a few stations that, um, as of now, are considered to have passed the deadline for their funding and were not able to open in time for the, the funds to be utilized for the, to develop those stations. So um, actual status of the network, again, as of July 27, 2017. So this bar graph on the left would actually look different right now. Um, at the top, you can see the 16 stations that were newly funded through GFO 15605. Now several of those stations can actually be more precisely described as having moved into um, beginning the phases where they're beginning their permitting apps and uh, beginning to actually do the development. Um, in addition, there were 29 open retail stations, uh, three open non-retail, and five fully constructed. One of those was the Torrance station at that time, which is now an open retail station. On the right, we have a map of all of the hydrogen fueling stations, um, and they are color coded according to the year that they would be open retail, with the exception of, of um, stations that do not have a plan to become retail yet. So these are some. There are some legacy stations remaining, like Newport Beach. The shown date of open date of 2012 is its open non-retail date, and right now there is not a plan for it to become retail. Otherwise, all of these these Stations are indicated by the, the year in which they will become open retail. And you can see that the circles represent those stations that are actually open right now, and the squares are those that are still in development. The 16 funded stations from GFO 15605 are further highlighted by the asterisk behind the symbol. So I'll leave this up for a moment so that people can absorb some of this information. I have a question before you move on yeah. that came in. Um, you mentioned that some of the stations uh, weren't completed in time to use their funding. What happens to that funding? So that's probably a question that is uh, better answered by the Energy Commission as they handle these funds. My understanding is it depends on the vintage of the funds uh, in terms of whether they can go back directly into hydrogen station funding under uh, AB8 and the ARFBTP if they have to go back to more generally to ARFBTP and then be reallocated to hydrogen station or if they go back to a more general fund. Okay, so we will follow up with the Energy Commission make sure we have that answer. So uh, again, this is the projection of the 62 stations and when they are expected to come to become open uh, in, into the future. So what we're looking at is most of the stations will actually become open retail by 2020. We do, again, right now have two stations that are currently open non-retail and do not ha yet have a, uh, an identified path forward to open retail by 2020. We also project that a few stations from uh, PON 13607 will actually be uh, developed in, and become open retail by 2020. Um, and this is mostly due to uncertainties in their current uh, plan timeline. And we can see that all of the GFO 15605 stations are expected to be open by the end of 2019, according to, their, to the application material that was submitted for that uh, solicitation. So moving on to finding four, which uh, addresses the vehicle, the rollout and the projections for vehicles moving forward. Our updated auto manufacturer survey responses do indicate a one-year short-term and two-year long-term delay compared to previously reported projections. 
feedback from the auto manufacturers has emphasized that acceleration is possible with coordinated acceleration and station deployment. So in annually, uh, ARB sends a, a, a survey to all auto manufacturers as part of its LEV and ZEV, the low emission vehicle and zero emission vehicle program. And automobile manufacturers are asked to provide projections for fuel cell electric vehicle deployment uh, specific to each county throughout the state for two different periods. The first period is the three years following the year of the survey. So in this year, that was 2018, 2019, and 2020. And auto manufacturers are required in that period to provide the number of fuel cell electric vehicles they anticipate to deploy within each county and statewide. The following three years, 2021 through 2023, in this year's survey are an optional addition to the survey. And we have administered this survey each year for the past four years. Traditionally, we've been reporting only the final count at the end of the mandatory period and at the end of the optional period. So if you compare the numbers on this, uh, on this figure at the diamond with the previous reports, you'll see that these match up. So this was in 2014, we reported that the then current projection for 2017 was 6650. In 2015, the then current for 2018 was 10,500. So our newest number at the end of the mandatory period is 13,400 vehicles anticipated by 2020. The shaded region shows the variation across all years of surveys that we have taken. So this is new information that we are presenting this year. We are now providing insight into the variation and the uncertainty that we have seen ourselves through the multiple years of taking surveys uh, from the auto manufacturers themselves. And there's similar information provided for the optional years. So our latest and furthest projection is that by 2023, there will be 37,400 fuel cell vehicles on the road in California. We identify the short-term delay as one year based on the comparison of our 2020 projection for this year to last year's 2019 projection, which are essentially the same. And we identify up to a two-year delay by comparing this year's projection for 2023 to the 2015 projection for 2021. There are additional pieces of information that can be gained by uh, investigating these, the data on, on this figure. So one um, method is to look at how uh, actual deployments compare to the projections. So ARB has access to DMV registrations at two specific points in time. These are snapshots in time of the number of active fuel cell vehicle registrations. Those are every October shown by the red circle and every April shown by the red triangle. If the actual deployments are in line with projections from previous years, then you should see that circles would remain below the projections because, and triangles would remain above the projections for the next following year because these are end of year projections. So what we're seeing is that because these April registrations are still remaining below the projections, we're seeing that, that they are actually still um, not, uh, or that they are lagging the projections themselves. In addition, there's a general trend of increasing uncertainty looking further into the future. Um, this should not be that surprising as it becomes more and more difficult to project out with certainty what the markets might look like, what the developments might be, the further and out you are trying to make a projection for. However, we do um, emphasize that this is, this is a trend that we do see. And now we are providing a little bit more information in terms of comparing optional and mandatory period totals. So it is not actually um, trivial that this, op this mandatory period total is less than the optional period. Um, as the as a date for a survey number becomes enters into the mandatory period, that could mean that more auto manufacturers should be actually supplying responses than they might if it's only an optional period date. However, we're seeing that e um, in spite of that, we're still getting lower numbers in our mandatory data than we are in our optional period data. 
As I mentioned, the survey itself is actually county-based, so we uh, collect data for the state. Um, auto manufacturers do have varying degrees of specificity in their responses in terms of how they, uh, uh, how they respond with the county-based distribution of the vehicles. Um, ARB does utilize its own analysis, its own market analysis tools, which I'll discuss brief, uh, shortly, um, to fill in the gaps in the distribution when necessary. And so what we're looking at here is that Los Angeles County still remains the highest, uh, the, or essentially projected to be the, much lar the largest market across the state. Notice that the access for Los Angeles County is actually double the access for all these other county figures. And so again, we do have 1,600 vehicles currently on the road according to DMV registrations, but we projected 2,800 by the end of this year based on the DMV data and the auto manufacturer survey data. And then we project by 2020 and 2023, 13,400 and 37,400 vehicles on the road. Finding five uh, looks at our recommendations of locations of need and number of stations needed in those locations for uh, new hydrogen fueling stations. So an updated assessment of the fuel cell electric vehicle market and coverage indicate major portions of Los Angeles County as highest priority. Select areas across the San Francisco Bay, Orange County, and San Diego also are high priority. We identify these regions based on an analysis of coverage provided by the existing and funded stations compared to an analysis of the first adopter market and where those markets might, might be highest. We then utilize that information and the projections provided by, of, of the volume of vehicles provided by the auto manufacturers to complete a capacity needs analysis, which informs the number of stations in this table. So this column here that identifies the areas is a coverage-based analysis, whereas the column on the right is a capacity-based analysis. And this is why we see areas at times like San Francisco in this year's analysis, where it, we do see a need for coverage in part of that area, but based on the number of vehicles we expect to be in that area by 2020, uh, 2020, 2021, we don't yet need a station for capacity reasons. So that's why there's a zero in this, in this uh, column. We've see, had previously had this for other uh, priority areas in, in other reports. So here is a uh, map of both the coverage analysis on the left and the capacity need analysis on the right. So in both maps, uh, deeper blue is a lower need, lower priority, um, and a bright red is a higher need and higher priority. The priority areas on the previous table are defined by these magenta outlines. Um, and then you can see that the stations that are funded and awarded are these white dots on this figure on the left. And so we can see that the priority areas are defined by those areas where there are, where the high need in terms of coverage coalesce and are, and, and are different from their surroundings. On the right, the capacity need is determined by distributing those 37,400 vehicles across the state according to population and market evaluation, and then comparing that to the coverage and capacity of all the stations that are funded. Finding six uh, concerns the projections for uh, station development in comparison to the projections for vehicle deployment. So long-term fuel cell electric vehicle deployment plans continue to indicate a need for uh, dispensing capacity beyond business as usual development. So this is not a new finding. This is similar to the finding we've, we've made for the past three years. Um, in this figure, the green shaded area is the number of vehicles that could be funded according to the, or could be fueled and supported according to the funded hydrogen uh, station network. The purple shaded area is the number of vehicles that could be supported assuming business as usual continued development through ABA. In this year's analysis, that has been taken to be eight stations per year per funding cycle of $20 million 
and each station is 300 kilograms per, assumed to be 300 kilograms per day. This is based on developments that have come to, to be apparent through GFO 15605, where almost all of the stations awarded are more than 300 kilograms per day in capacity. By comparison, prior to GFO 15605, the average was 180 kilograms per day. So this is providing an updated uh, assessment of the capacity um, in comparison to the vehicles. The yellow bars represent the range of all vehicle projections for all surveys from 2014 through 2017, and the blue diamonds are the reported values at the ends of the uh, mandatory and optional periods. And so we can see that through 2020, the capacity of the funded stations and through, and through business as usual is most likely to be sufficient to meet the needs of the uh, deployed vehicles. However, as we move into 2021, um, there's certainly a need to continue developing stations as the 62 existing stations could not supply even the lowest projected uh, uh, fuel cell vehicle volume on the roads. And by our uh, reported number, it's even uh, the, the uh, number of vehicles is greater than the uh, fueling capacity that could be supported. And this becomes even more apparent by 2022, where essentially there is no overlap between the vehicle uh, projections, or it's very little overlap between the vehicle projections and the amount of vehicles that could possibly be supported through business as usual um, development. I do want to emphasize again, this is business as usual, assuming only eight stations per year at 300 kilograms per day. So this does not assume yet any uh, new developments or possible developments in additional private investment in the stations or different funding mechanisms that might enable a more rapid, um, a more rapid deployment of stations. So looking a little bit further into the detail of those numbers, um, we provide capacity balances both on the county level and uh, at the state. So in 2020, with the current 62 stations, most counties are fine in terms of capacity. They would have enough, uh, enough fuel, avail fueling, fuel dispensing available to, to meet the needs of the projected vehicles in the county. But if we project out the 2023 vehicle fleet with just the 62 current stations, there's obviously a need for more hydrogen in essentially every single county. If we look at business as usual development still, though, we can see that on a statewide basis, again, we project out a deficit by 2023 and actually earlier um, in the available fueling capacity at the state level um, compared to the, the vehicles that we expect to be on the road. And so looking at 2020, we saw that there were a few counties that had a small capacity gap. Um, this is actually relatively easily met uh, if with targeted investment. As we note in the report, these represent essentially one station's worth, one additional station's worth of hydrogen fueling beyond known plans. And, and then looking towards, um, toward further out into 2023, there are much larger gaps in some of the more major markets that we expect, like Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, San Francisco, and Santa Clara. So, Andrew, before you move on, I have a lot of questions yeah. <laughs> that, are, that are all say the same thing. How many cars can each station fill? What was your math for estimating them? So, in this figure, we are so well. Okay, so in these figures, we are actually using the data that we have available on each specific vehicle rated uh, um, uh, fuel consumption rate based on the information that's provided on the auto manufacturer survey. So this actually, we do track that there will be X number of Marais, X number of clarities projected in each county, and those will consume on average um, a certain number of kilograms per mile. And then we use standard assumptions for uh, mileage based on vehicle age um, in, in agreement with our MFAC modeling, which is um, a, more, a more general vehicle model at the, at the um, ARB. 
For this particular figure, we do take a different tactic because we're trying to translate um, hydrogen fueling capacity of the stations into the shaded regions and what they represent in terms of vehicles. So in this figure, we take the uh, total statewide capacity and we assume that uh, on average vehicles will use 0 0.7 kilograms per day of hydrogen and the shaded region is plus or minus 10 percent of that. All right, so I didn't understand any of that. <laughs> so is like today's stations, you're figuring it's about 10 cars a day, about 20 cars a day, about 100 cars a week. Give me the, the crisp version of that answer. Um, so that, um, Today? We don't, yeah, we don't actually perform these calculations on, a, on that basis, but today's stations could typically, if you're assuming that about 180 kilogram per day station is the average, and each fill is probably going to be around four kilograms, um, then that ends up being about uh, 40 cars a day, right? Okay. 45 cars a day. Yeah. 40 to 45 cars a day. Okay, good. I can live with that one. Okay. That should be, in, and that is actually in, that is actually in line also with that 0 0.7 kilogram per day average that we utilize for this. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay. So finding seven um, uh, goes to possible um, possible options for addressing that gap in in capacity in the further future in 2021 and beyond. So California's fuel cell electric vehicle and hydrogen fueling industries have made the transition from pre-commercial to early commercial phase. This is actually very important. This is something that um, a lot of effort has been put into to achieve this and uh, pretty much industry-wide there is agreement that this has happened in the past year. Funding programs through the state likely do need to adjust for maximum effective use of state dollars. So um, the argument that we have presented in this, in this uh, report is that because we've made this transition, because of all the work that's happened up to this point and that has been successful from the demonstration phase to the pre-commercial phase, all of that's been successful and all of that, uh, all those funding mechanisms have gotten us to this point. And now we're looking at potentially different market realities, different market goals, and the funding mechanisms may need to also um, recognize that and adjust for that. And so what we have proposed is that some goals for new funding mechanisms are to leverage complementary state opportunities, lower perceived risk in particular for private investors, to enable them to increase private funds that could be leveraged by state dollars, maintaining con more uh, constant availability of funds. So um, looking at are there options for programs that aren't uh, annual or every other year in terms of a one large block of grants being, being awarded. Building hydrogen fueling demand in order to make sure that market dynamics are able to, to um, eventually help move this from a state, uh, uh, a heavily state funded effort to a self-sustaining um, uh, industry. Supporting the development of again, those competitive market dynamics and then, but still looking to maintain these grant funding options where it does make sense, right? So we, what we see is that in areas where there is a lot of development of the hydrogen fueling network right now, that as that development continues, it may make sense to uh, perhaps look for uh, funding mechanisms that require more private investment in order to get more out of each state dollar so that then you could use those higher uh, those grants that require more state dollars in areas where the business case may not be as readily apparent, where it may be more difficult to establish a station. So say if it's the first station in a new market. Finding eight um, discusses some of the technical uh, capabilities of the station. So um, in particular, uh, the high step device and program have provided unique progress and experience in station performance validation. Uh, we find that near-term expansion of this program will be necessary. So the high step program and device um, was initiated by um, uh, cooperation with uh, the Department of Energy, um, NREL, Sandia, and uh, various state agencies. And uh, the intent was to address the problem presented by this top uh, figure. 
that in order to declare stations open and open for retail sales, traditionally, uh, that required each auto manufacturer going to the, to the uh, hydrogen station, testing the hydrogen station's performance, deciding whether or not it was within the safe guidelines for their vehicle, which would often require multiple visits from each auto manufacturer. And this could take weeks, if not months, in order to, to coordinate all of those efforts and all of those schedules. The idea is that a device could be developed that could replace, um, at least that could eventually replace those um, actual hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, individually going to the station and could provide enough information for uh, industry consensus around uh, individual station's performance to validate that it, that it uh, operates appropriately. And so this device has been in use in California um, for a little bit over a year, um, and it's been utilized to help um, open several of the stations that are now operating today in, in our retail network. Uh, the figure at the bottom gives an indication of the time breakdown for a typical high step test. So typically, testing occurs over a two-week period. The first week is the actual testing in the field. The second week is analysis um, back at ARB um, and, and coordination and discussion with the auto manufacturers and the station developers to make a determination of the, uh, the performance of the, of the station. And that is for a single test. Some stations have required multiple uh, tests through uh, high step. But uh, the idea is that eventually this should be standardized enough um, the industry gains experience enough to be able to complete this kind of uh, this kind of testing in a single visit. And finding nine is a little bit new this year. Uh, it addresses uh, hydrogen production capacity. So to, uh, in past reports, we focused mostly on hydrogen dispensing, um, but we uh, have seen through many public-private um, interactions that hydrogen production capacity and especially renewable hydrogen production capacity are rapidly becoming a priority in California. So the figure on the right uh, shows essentially the known gaseous and liquid non-oil merchant hydrogen capacity. So this is essentially the hydrogen production capacity available in the state that's sold on a merchant market that is not sold to to oil purposes. You, hydrogen is an important, um, an important resource for actually oil refining. And so we have about 55 tons per day capacity according to uh, data from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And today, we, our fuel cell vehicles on the road consume about two tons per day. And so that's coming from this existing merchant capacity. As we look out into 2020 and 2023, you know, that grows to nine tons per day and 26 tons per day consumption. And there's an open question about where is this hydrogen going to come from? Is this hydrogen going to um, be able to be diverted from the other merchant, uh, merchant markets that are currently buying this hydrogen? Right now, it seems that that's not very likely. Or is it more likely that new hydrogen production is going to, capability is going to need to be developed in order to meet the demand, the future demand of the vehicles. And this might be uh, the more likely case, or it may be a mix of both. We don't know. Um, the purple shaded area is to show that the extremes of that. So at this bottom extreme, that's all of the future 26 tons per day coming from existing production. At this top extreme, that would be all of it being new production uh, within the state. So um, just to take a slightly closer look at that in this figure, this is based again on data collected by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. The darker uh, pieces are the California production capacity. The gray is on-site captive um, uh, hydrogen production capacity for oil refining, essentially hydrogen that's made at refineries for the refinery. The orange, is hydrogen that's made not at the refinery, but still ends up going to that purpose. The blue is liquid, is a, sorry, gaseous merchant production, so uh, hydrogen that's produced for a variety of uses and sold on an open market. And we can see that only 29 tons per day of gaseous hydrogen exists in Cal production exists in California. And the green is liquid production, only 26 
tons per day in California. For non-oil. For non-oil. And so, and hydrogen for fuel cell electric vehicles is some sliver of that. And so what we're looking at is that for the, for the goals and the, and the um, expected fuel cell vehicle deployments in California, this could present a problem eventually, and it's something that needs to be addressed. We are encouraged that the California Energy Commission has begun an effort to start addressing this. Um, recently, they held their second workshop. It was a, a, a grant funding opportunity um, concepts workshop for a one ton per day, 100% renewable hydrogen production facility to be cited within California. So we're looking forward to the continuing development of that solicitation and, and the eventual development of, of a, of a um, production facility in California. Um, before I move into special topics, is there any? Oh. Oh, yes. <laughs> Are there any questions so, we should address? Uh, yeah, some of them I've been hitting you as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, a question that came up a few times early on is that you talked about by the end of the year there would be 34 stations, yet one of your slides shows 37. Is that because you're counting the non-retail stations? Yes, yeah, so the 34 are, here we go. The 34 here are open retail. There are three stations non-retail that we don't expect to be converted by the end of this year. And actually going forward, I, there are two stations that we don't know, they do not currently have a plan for conversion to retail. So when you're counting your total numbers later on, mm -hmm. are you continuing to count those? Yes. So in our total numbers later on in, yeah, sorry, <laughs> like in this figure, you can see we are counting 37. So we're counting the open retail, open non-retail. Okay. Um, we do that because we do have an understanding that um, open retail stations are available to fuel cell drivers of any vehicle, and they can freely drive up, uh, pay with their credit card, and drive away and use the station. Non-retail stations essentially require um, individual auto manufacturers to approve that station to be used by their by drivers of their vehicles. Um, we don't anticipate that we do not anticipate that those stations are sitting completely idle with no customers. Okay, and this question I'm going to read you verbatim okay. because I don't want to paraphrase. Is the projected shortfall based only on aggregate annual hydrogen supply demand or is there a measure of peak demand on high travel days? This is, this is an only an aggregate annual. Um, while it's an aggregate, you could say kilogram per day or daily, we do not look at, for example, variation throughout the day that, you know, there's Thanksgiving is a high travel day or Labor Day weekend is a high travel weekend. We don't get into that level of detail here. We, we look at annual um, uh, vehicle miles traveled. Okay, so an annual is the answer then. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what's, the what's the timeline for a renewable hydrogen production facility operation and siting? I don't think it's something. If that is in, in with respect to the, um, the solicitation I mentioned, um, we probably will follow up, should follow up with a link to that solicitation um, information. I, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't remember. Okay. And um, the last question I have in this section, I have some other questions too that we'll be following up with. Some of them are really specific questions okay. and we'll follow up with those. Um, with the uh, trucks starting to come on the road, how are trucks going to impact this picture? So, so far, well, all of the hydrogen fueling capacity that we are discussing is all for light duty vehicles. Literally, the stations that are have been developed and that are funded under the Energy Commission's grant solicitations, those are specifically for light duty vehicles. The equipment at the site physically cannot uh, fuel medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, so that would be a separate concern. We are um, tracking that um, through not only ourselves, but other uh, staff members at, at the Air Resources Board and staff members at the Energy Commission are uh, continually keeping an eye on this. Um, medium and heavy duty is a much newer development. Um, recently, we did actually in the report highlight some of those, those latest developments, especially in heavy duty trucking. That have happened in the past year. Um, I know that the uh, Fuel Cell Partnership uh, recently published a heavy-duty roadmap 
that's similar to the light duty roadmap that was published back in 2012. And so um, I think those are all, that's a great resource to, to understand what some of the most recent um, information is about that sector. But in terms of these numbers, they do not have an effect on these numbers. And um, because it is an open ARB solicitation, which I assume you can't comment on, mm -hmm. and I probably can, there is a proposal out that's due next week for sustainable freight mm -hmm. that includes a requirement that if you're going to, uh, you have to include infrastructure in the plan. So I do know in that one proposal that they're looking for infrastructure to be built with the, with the vehicles. Um, the, uh, I have one other question that popped in here. You showed the pictures of the hydrogen producers, the merchants and the, the dedicated. Mm -hmm. Are they all running at full capacity or do you know if they were able to mm -hmm. increase the capacity? So, um, I'm trying to remember. I believe that this data, these data are, I'm trying to remember from the, from the source. I think these are capacity numbers. And so, um, this would be if they are running at full capacity. I believe that typically, uh, typically the the captive on site on purpose is uh, it's a, usually known or assumed to be a pretty it's a pretty good assumption that all of that is being used um, at the oil refining facility. I do not know how much of everything else is you know act, it, how much of that is actually produced each year. Okay, that's a really good uh, fuel salt partnership topic to mm -hmm. tear into a little bit yeah. and see. Because I have heard previously, years ago, Air Products mentioned that they still had room within their plant um, to increase production, but they didn't say that that was a California right. plant. Which is, we'll look into that. Which I imagine is how we're able to get this two tons per day shaving off the top right now. The question, the open question is, when this gets to nine and 26, is that still just shaving off the top, or is this a major issue that we yeah. have to face? Um, all right, so some of these I'm going to answer because they're very specific questions. We'll either answering you online or we'll follow up with you afterwards. Okay. okay. So moving on then. All right, so there were several uh, new and additional topics in this year's annual evaluation. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on each one of these. Um, the first are updates to our tool that we utilize to uh, analyze uh, coverage and capacity needs throughout the state. So CHIT is the California Hydrogen Infrastructure Tool. It is a GIS, Geographical Information System based tool, uh, first introduced in 2015. Uh, at that time, it was uh, made publicly available. It's online currently right now, still at ARB's uh, hydrogen analysis webpage. Uh, at the end of this presentation, there will be a link to the hydrogen page for ARB. Um, and in the past two years, we've undertaken many efforts to update the tool, uh, some in response to uh, feedback from industry and from the public, some in response to needs that have developed within our own program and within the, uh, and to make it be more amenable to the uh, Energy Commission's grant solicitation process to make it more useful to that process. So CHIT 2017 release will become public uh, this fall, we uh, pretty much have it finalized. We're working on the last little bits of um, documentation and preparing for the release. We will announce a webinar. Um, in 2015, we provided a webinar that covered the development of the tool and the data background. Um, this webinar will be a refresher to give an overview of what the tool is, its major data inputs, but then also focus on the new features uh, that are in this release. And so that includes uh, simulated traffic intensity data. In 2016, we also had another, another webinar where we discussed this, the development of this data. Um, implementation of auto manufacturer survey and DMV registration data. We see that um, as both the fueling market and the fuel cell electric vehicle market continue to evolve, we will need to move away from tools that do market projections and look more towards tools that are addressing the market realities and the needs of the vehicles and the stations that are on the ground right now. So we're starting to implement that. Um, we looked at different ways of actually calculating the coverage gap. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we've developed in the past year a local capacity needs calculation method that was done in support of GFO 15605. It wasn't in the, uh, in the 2015 release of 
of CHIT, so it will be this year in 2017. Uh, there are tools that allow um, more, you know, that, that improve the usability of, of, the, um, of the package, um, and there are various data updates and process improvements. Uh, for example, um, based on evolving understanding, uh, we, we moved away from a, a, a uh, square grid analysis to a hexagonal analysis grid in this, this 2017 version. So for those of you who are wondering what exactly is this tool, um, CHIT is a planning tool intended to provide a general direction for areas of needed infrastructure, and it is a relative analysis. CHIT looks at what is the relative intensity of the potential market for fuel cell electric vehicles in an area and compares that with the relative intensity of the coverage provided in that same area. And so anywhere in the state where those two do not match up well, where you have a high market but not very good coverage, will be will receive a higher uh, priority evaluation through this tool. And it does this by making a market assessment based on open public data uh, sources. Uh, new this year, it also takes into account commuter traffic assessments, and then it compares that to the coverage provided by all the stations. And you can get out of this tool your assessment of coverage gap, and again, new this year, your assessment of the localized capacity need. So um, on the left is just a, a pictorial to show you in case there are any people on the webinar familiar with 2015 version of CHIT. You can see that the number of tools has greatly expanded. Um, in the webinar, we'll cover everything that's new um, in, this, in this tool. Uh, on the right is some of the information about the traffic data that we developed. Uh, we stress that um, in 2015, we were looking for observed traffic data to incorporate, and we could not find a, a detailed enough, reliable enough data source for that to evaluate it across the entire state. So we presented on a simulated traffic data set that we developed. Uh, the webinar for that is online. All the information for that is online. And out of that webinar, uh, there was a recommendation that that traffic data, which is the the uh, raw version of it is in the top figure, could be more accurately um, depicting the fuel cell vehicle first adopters traffic patterns if, they, if all of the traffic was weighted by um, the market evaluation that we have. So that's what's shown on the bottom figure, and that's what we implemented this year in our evaluations in the report. So, um, and then we also did a lot of tuning of the market evaluations. We incorporated updated information. We used a lot of census data and a lot of DMV data. So we updated those to the most recent versions. In the figure on the left, you can see what the effect is. Um, the blue shaded areas were kind of the highest market areas under the 2015 evaluation. And the red is now uh, the highest market uh, evaluations in 2017. And then, as I had mentioned, we looked at different ways to consider and, and weight the different, um, the different factors that we use in our market evaluation. And so uh, on the right, you can see two, the, the figure in the middle, the original gap equation, that's what we utilize. We actually still recommend using this equation and this evaluation um, in the report. But on the far right, there was, we explored other uh, ways of considering the data and combining the data into a market and coverage evaluation. Um, in addition, uh, we discuss a little bit more about renewables and the LCFS, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program. Uh, the figure on the left is actually one that we produce every year. I want to note that this year, we now are projecting that once all of the hydrogen fueling stations that are funded are actually built, the Overall percentage of renewable implementation is 37%. This is lower than previous years, and this is because in GFO 15605, all of the applicants uh, mentioned that they will meet the minimum requirement of 33%, whereas in POND 13607, we had quite a few stations that were 100% renewable. So um, we're, uh, we're projecting that we will still be exceeding the minimum requirement of the solicitations and of um, Senate Bill 1505. Uh, for those on the phone who may not be as familiar, Senate Bill 1505 requires that all publicly co-funded stations must be at least 33% renewable, and that once three and a half um, uh, million 
uh, sorry, three and a half million kilograms per day of uh, fueling is dispensed uh, in the state, then also every private um, hydrogen fueling station would need to meet the 33% requirement. So that kind of trigger is shown by this blue line. And what we're showing is that we'll probably meet that trigger in about 2020. So the blue shaded area is renewable hydrogen from the projected network. The red is the, the non-renewable hydrogen from the funded network. And this is the green. The green is the non-renewable from the yet to be funded, the future projection of stations. We also um, worked with, uh, with colleagues at NREL to provide a uh, revised um, uh, assessment of the effect of LCFS credit valuation on uh, station um, business cases. In the uh, December 2016 Joint Agency Staff Report, a, um, I'm sorry, the uh, assumed credit value for LCFS credits was only 35 cents per kilogram. Based on information that our program has collected from, uh, from business entities who actually participate in the program and who have, uh, who have um, suggested possible renew more highly renewable methods of producing hydrogen, we're seeing that LCFS credits could be worth as much as $2.50, seven cents per kilogram. And so we had, we asked our colleagues at NREL to provide some updated numbers on what that means for a hydrogen station's uh, business prospects. And we can see that it, it markedly improved what's called the profitability index. So essentially the, the likelihood of, of the station being able to be a profitable venture. Um, it's kind of a measure of its, its payoff period and also reduces the break even levelized, levelized break even price of hydrogen that the hydrogen needs to be sold at in order for the station to make, begin making a profit at the desired year of operation. And so we can see that LCFS credits through this evaluation at this higher value of somewhere around $2, $2 to $3 is a win-win for both the station developer and for the customer. And so we really want to get this message out there that people uh, and companies involved in hydrogen production and hydrogen sales, the value of these LCFS credits is very high. Um, especially considering what the uh, credits have typically been, been trading for. So um, for more information, we do suggest getting in touch with uh, the Air Resources Board's LCFS program staff. Um, <clears throat> another topic that we added to this year's discussion is uh, disadvantaged communities. Now, the stations that are developed under AB8 for hydrogen fuel do not actually fall within the jurisdiction of the legislation um, that uh, requires investments in disadvantaged communities. However, we recognize that this is quickly becoming uh, a, a uh, emphasis across the board for all state investments, especially in the transportation sector. So we performed an analysis to look at the, uh, the distribution of the hydrogen stations with respect to disadvantaged communities. And we found that 13 of the 62 stations are actually located directly within a census tract that is identified as a disadvantaged community. Now, uh, the legislation that discusses uh, investments for disadvantaged communities uh, mentions either investments in or uh, benefiting those communities. And so what we took to mean as that benefiting is that essentially in all of our analyses, we look at a 15 minute coverage as essentially where people will be willing to drive the maximum distance people would be willing to drive to the station from. And so we utilized that same metric and we looked at the 15 minute coverage provided by the 62 funded stations. And we found that essentially 40% of the state's disadvantaged community population lives within 15 minutes of a hydrogen fueling station. And that split then of the stations of the covered population is essentially 78, 22% for the 62 stations. So we find that, you know, even without, um, even without intentionally doing so, the uh, hydrogen fueling station network is, is approaching what the goals of the, the, uh, the legislation for disadvantaged community investments are looking to accomplish. We also this year included information uh, from the clean vehicle rebate project. So, for, again, for those who may not be 
Um, as familiar, when you purchase a fuel cell electric vehicle or a battery electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, you are eligible for a cash rebate from the state of California. And as part of that program, you're also invited to uh, participate in a survey, um, actually a series of surveys. We looked at the first survey that um, has been available for fuel cell electric vehicle drivers. It asked questions about their purchase decisions and their decisions to adopt the vehicle. And we, are, we can use these uh, survey responses as essentially a market-based check on the data inputs and fundamental assumptions we implement in our uh, market analysis for CHIP. And so I want to cover some high-level uh, findings that we, that we looked at. So uh, concerning purchase motiv motivations, the, the most important thing to fuel cell, via fuel cell electric vehicle drivers is reducing environmental impact. Um, so that is right in line with what we find and what we hear about fuel cell electric vehicle drivers continually uh, uh, expressing the desire for more renewable and lower carbon Product, uh, production methods of hydrogen and, and why that's a, an important aspect going forward. In CHIT, we look at a hybrid electric vehicle and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle adoption as indicators for future fuel cell electric vehicle adoption as one of many of our indicators. And we're seeing through the CVRP uh, data that that's pretty well um, supported. We specifically do not utilize BEV because our assumption is that hybrid and plug-in hybrid allow drivers to have um, more environmentally sensitive, sensitive options for transportation that do not require them to change their fueling habits. Whereas BEV, especially in the early days of BEV um, deployment, required changes in, in fueling uh, behavior. Uh, so um, we're finding that that seems to be, be well um, justified. Uh, in terms of ownership concerns, the most often picked and the most often picked as the highest concern is too few hydrogen stations for, uh, for the travel needs. So this emphasizes just exactly why AB8 is important, why we need to continue uh, this program full steam ahead and, and even find ways to um, accelerate the impact of the program. When we look at the most frequent fueling location, we see that um, the near home, which is a fundamental assumption of CHIT's evaluation, is the most often, often location where our drivers fuel. But there is a significant you know, number of people who also look at uh, fueling along their commute. And so this is part of what we've been addressing with the 2017 update to, to CHIT, um, at least as far as we have been able to, to manage it. On the right, this is a little bit interesting. In this um, figure, this breaks down the data from the, well, this is the desired fueling location and it's broken down similar by, based on the data on the left. So each group uh, is where that group fuels the most, but then where they want more stations. So in, no matter where drivers currently fuel, they all essentially want more stations near their home most often. That's their number one pick or their most often their number one and number two pick. So um, even though we do have people who are fueling along their commutes, they still really want those stations at home. So that's, this is also uh, speaks to, in our implementation of the traffic data, to include it, but we did not, if you read the report, you see we include it, but we don't include it to a high, uh, with a high weighting in our analysis. I mentioned previously that uh, funding mechanisms might need to adjust to the new market realities. Um, in the report, ARB provided initial initial exploratory analysis of a few potential alternative funding mechanisms. This is not meant to be um, uh, you know, authoritative or exhaustive. We, looked at, we had time to look at a few options and provide some quantitative analysis that we hope to present as essentially a springboard for starting discussions at the state and with the public in terms of what might be viable funding mechanisms going forward through AB8. In addition, the Energy Commission is already working in parallel on similar efforts and will hold open and public workshops to refine the strategy and the funding design. And so this is in keeping with, with the Energy Commission's you know, um, um, uh, methods overall and their goals overall to maintain an open and public uh, uh, funding process under AB8. So some of the ideas that we described were loan loss reserves or loan guarantees, a certificate of guarantee program, 
uh, increasing in direct investment from private uh, entities, and then a renewable fuel sales reimbursement option, but which would be highly dependent on coordinated uh, efforts and developments with the low carbon fuel standard uh, program at ARB in order to uh, track fuel, um, in order to track and certify uh, fuel sales. And then we emphasize that there may be a need to have essentially hybrid options. As I had mentioned, you might want one of these methods that essentially, um, one of these methods that may require higher degrees of private investment, maybe in areas where there's already a lot of hydrogen development, where the business case might be more easily made for that uh, private investment, but then keep the high CapEx uh, grants in areas where the, the business case might be more difficult. So just to look at a, a few of these figures, um, so this is on the bottom, this is looking at a loan loss reserve. So if a loan loss reserve uh, provides 20% leverage rate on that on uh, the loan loss reserve and with the 20 million per year if we look at setting aside 0 to 20 dollars or 20, 0 to 20 million dollars of the total available we see that um, you know immediately if we split the funding if we use a hybridized approach there might be a be a way to simply accelerate the number of stations that are developed each year through the 20 million dollars and this is because um, at its most basic level because of the 20% leverage rate, which is lower, significantly lower than the 80, 75 to 80% of CapEx that the current grant programs provide. However, this may be an amount that could be uh, viable in high market areas or in highly developed areas. As I mentioned, the actual specifics and particulars will have to be uh, worked out in open and public um, um, workshops through the Energy Commission. And then we looked at sensitivity uh, on projections like this for the various uh, key aspects. So, for example, changing the leverage rate. And you can see as we increase the leverage rate, it essentially approaches the same exact thing as uh, the current grant funding process. Um, but then also, look, and so you can see um, in the report uh, some examples of that. I did also want to highlight the, um, the renewable uh, throughput reimbursement. Um, so what we did is we looked at comparing the current grant uh, solicitation kind of setup to what, how many stations could be uh, supported through a renewable fuel sales reimbursement program. And so this is looking at um, out to 2023, we uh, projected 32 additional stations beyond our 62 current ones. And we looked at um, how much would it cost the state to provide uh, fuel reimbursement at various dollars per kilogram for those 32 stations and compared that to the cost through the current type of grant program and we looked at either a 1.6 million dollars per station or 2.1 per station and we found that there may be the chance for significant um, options for a, a, uh, a renewable hydrogen sales reimbursement program. A key assumption here was that we were looking at reimbursing only the amount of hydrogen sold, renewable hydrogen sold, above the 33% minimum required by SB 1505. So we can see that, you know, up to $5 or maybe even $6 per kilogram, if a station is selling 80% uh, of its hydrogen as renewable hydrogen, this program could actually be slightly cheaper for the state than the current grant solicitation program and that difference could be reinvested into additional stations. And so this is a way of looking at different uh, funding structures and how that can then translate to uh, more, rapid, uh, more rapid deployment and funding of additional stations. In terms of the, uh, the station performance, um, we provide additional information on high steps and for especially uh, for those who would be looking to uh, interact with the program or those who would be looking to participate with the program, wanting to have the, the device come to their station. So we provide uh, examples of passing fill data, both in terms of pressure and temperature, and divergent uh, fill data in terms of pressure and temperature. 
And then finally, um, earlier this year, the auto manufacturers provided to ARB and then posted publicly through the partnership a list of priority locations for, uh, I believe, 45 hydrogen uh, fueling stations going forward. And so we provided kind of a, um, we actually received this after we were, had already done all of our analysis through uh, for the evaluate, for the annual evaluation, but we did have time to provide kind of a comparison of that list to uh, the station, to the analysis that we had performed. And we found that in a lot of cases, uh, most cases, there's at least a pretty good uh, match between, agreement between our evaluation and the auto manufacturer's desirability for the station. Um, and in some cases, there's actually very high agreement. Uh, you can see some of these stations like this uh, Beverly Hills Wilshire Boulevard station is in a very high scoring uh, capacity or coverage gap location according to our new assessments. Um, same with this Whipple Avenue station and, and others. So um, these eight stations were locations were the only ones in the letter that we had received um, specific addresses for. Others were uh, more like were, were uh, cities along with um, major highway intersections. So we did perform that analysis. We're looking to continually iterate with the auto manufacturers to understand what might be the differences in the identification, their identification of these areas in comparison with uh, how our tool has identified those areas. And with that, that's all of the information that we have to share today um, in the presentation. I want to point out that the report itself can be accessed at www.arb.ca.gov backslash hydrogen. Um, all four years reports up till now can be accessed there. There's also a link to our hydrogen evaluations page on that page, and that has all the information concerning our uh, tool chip and um, uh, and all the analyses we've done. So, the question. And we'll send uh, all of this information out with uh, our follow-up to the webinar too. So I have three more questions that came in. Okay. Uh, the first is kind of general. You you showed some stuff about the rebate, but the rebate's kind of on pause right now. Any any updates about CBRP? So um, I do know that the the um, cap and trade auction just completed and it was apparently very successful, close to a billion dollars. So um, it does require legislative action to appropriate the funds to the CVRP program. Um, uh, I, I am not a, a legislative insider, but um, last time this happened, I can say that eventually the funds were appropriated to the program, so I don't know of anything uh, that would indicate otherwise would happen this time. Um, as a personally a new fuel cell electric vehicle adopter, I can say that um, even though you may not receive your uh, your rebate until the program is funded again, you will still receive a survey invitation <laughs> as soon as you your application is approved. So uh, the surveys are still being sent out even though the, the um, rebates are, are on pause right now. And, and the rebates are on pause for everybody. Yes. It, yeah. For everybody. Um, so uh, we had another question about uh, uh, about the, you showed quite a bit of there the disadvantaged communities, mm -hmm. but the um, question was, are you, what plans are there to make the vehicles and the cost of fuel more affordable to the people living in those communities? Yeah, so this is a, this is a question. Um, we, we haven't yet dealt a lot with the vehicle side, the cost of the vehicle side. There is a lot of work already going on at the Department of Energy. Um, it's a lot of public-private partnerships with the auto manufacturers, with the auto, uh, the auto supply chain manufacturers, looking at the vehicles um, themselves. There's also work on the um, on the hydrogen and the stations themselves. But we are we are looking, beginning to look at uh, at least the production side and what can be done. I believe that the Energy Commission's um, uh, grant or solicitation for a renewable hydrogen production facility will be able to learn a lot about the market dynamics there. Um, it's something we're looking into. We recognize that uh, price reduction will likely be a very major issue for continued adoption of the vehicles and, and their spread into mainstream and, and mass market. Um, part of the good news, though, is that right now it is such a small market, and so the market is suffering high prices because of the low volume. But as the more vehicles get out there, there should be more opportunities for high volumes. And so at high volumes, there are there are projections for costs coming down simply due to scale. 
And um, when you're talking about renewable hydrogen, are you also including SMR with, with carbon capture as renewable? So um, I don't know about SMR with carbon capture. We uh, do have stations that do, S do uh, steam methane reformation of biogas and, uh, and bio-derived gas, but um, I don't believe that includes uh, carbon capture. However, the important thing to note is that even in that process, that is a much lower carbon emission than a gasoline vehicle, um, about half of the, the, uh, gas, the carbon emissions from gasoline. So um, while not a zero carbon emission source, it is still a, a preferable hydrogen production method. Okay, great. And um, the last question I have here is about, um, oh, I said that too soon. Um, what's the usable life, do you think, of the chip model? How long before it expires? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. Um, we we look at it on an annual basis. Um, it we it's meant to be flexible. It's meant to be more of a framework for um, evaluation rather than um, what's important that comes out of it. Is not it's or, it's more of the framework for evaluation for people to be able to, you could actually put in your own inputs instead of the ones we provide. Um, I do believe for the inputs we provided and the tuning we use right now, it is most amenable to the early adopter market. However, it's not going to be a very difficult thing to transition it into wider market. At the end of the day though, like I said earlier, as more of these vehicles get out there and more of the stations get out there, we want to transition away from trying to project where a market is and actually follow a market and understand the markets as they are rather than trying to understand what we need to anticipate. I would assume, too, that um, most of our big metropolitan planning organizations have their own uh, JF models they're using to figure out land planning and transit demand. Right. And the chip data could fall in, at some point. It could be the chip becomes integrated with what local governments are doing rather than what the state governments. Right. Um, actually, we the traffic data. So the even though we don't, we could not find traffic volume data, and we had to simulate that traffic speed data that we utilize to calculate these 15 minute coverage extents. Um, that comes from what's known at ARB as Tiger I, or as ITN, and that's the integrated traffic network. And that is essentially ARB receives the traffic models and traffic data from all of the MPOs and stitches it together. So we already do include that. Um, uh, what do you think is the difference between the number of car registrations and the projections for that year? So I saw this too, that, that um, you were, lo were looking at, you know, when you had the projections for the end of the year, right. we have actual registrations. Right. Um, so, right. So you're talking about the difference here between where we report 1,600 registrations in October and as of April, yeah. versus we're projecting 2,800 by the end of the year. Yes. And right. And I know that we're at 2,400 mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So we're right around that now. So that could be a difference in. So if we end up going beyond 2,800, that could be a difference in. Perhaps the auto manufacturers were more conservative on their. Um, survey responses. So this this number 2,800, this additional 1,200 here is from the auto manufacturer survey responses, and so um, they they provide what they expect for the current year and the next three years, and then optionally the three after that. Um, so maybe maybe we did get conservative estimates on the survey, and they'll blow past them. In which case, we'd be excited. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, uh... You went, uh, could you go back to the capital investment slide? Mm, are we talking about this kind of book? This one? Uh, nope, it's the one with the grant because it says, um, is your estimate for launching a fuel cell site and the offsetting grant, the net investment by the investor is $300,000? So it must be the loan loss reserve slide. Okay, I guess we're looking here. What was, could you repeat the question? Nope. He says, nope, that's not the right one. <laughs> this, Is one? It this one? This 
So the net investment by the investor is three hundred thousand. Also, um, not the right one. Stephen, we may have to follow up with you. Uh, Andrew may have to follow up with you directly to to know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so something out of the report. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember three. Yeah, because I'm not three hundred thousand today. I'll make sure that Andrew has your email address so he can follow up with you directly, Stephen. It's not helpful for me to be talking to the computer screen like I'm <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> All right. Any other last questions? And um, those of you who've been on our webinars before know that I've also been chatting with people online the whole time. We've had some very specific questions about a specific station location and some other numbers. Um, there was quite, uh, I had quite a little back and forth about that number of cars per station that we're projecting, mm -hmm. and it made me realize that we need to do a webinar on the math. Okay. Those of us who've been doing this for a long time, yeah. we understand our kind of math that we're using, right. but it would be great for other folks to also understand what we're calculating. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, you know, it's one thing to say we estimate 0.7 cars per day, but, yeah. or per kilograms yeah. per day. Yeah. But, you know, anybody who stood in line, which which we do in West Sacramento Station, knows that that's not how we're actually getting right. fuel. Right. So uh, uh, I think we should do that. Um, so uh, any other last question? Oh, and so, but everything that we chatted with online, you're going to see as well. Um, when we type up the Q&A log from this, you'll see everything that we talked about offline as well. So any other final remarks? Well, if not, we're right at the end of our time. So we'll thank uh, both Andrew and Gerhardt for, for presenting the report to us. We'll be sending you all of the information in the presentation, as well as a link to the report and uh, other where you can get into the chip tool and play with that yourself. So thank you all very much. Thank you.